It's okay, you can. <laughs> okay. Right, so it seems like majority of you have used Python. So um, I'm going to actually start from basics. So if you feel like it's too easy, feel free to do your own stuff. But um, this is going to be from basics, and then it's slowly going to move up. All right, let's, let's get started. Uh, before anything, this link goes to um, a repo that has all the files that I'm going to be going through. So if you want to move, um, go along with me, please download the files and um, go, uh, go along with me uh, with the tutorial. Okay, first thing first, what is Python? Uh, so Python is an interpreted language um, and um, opposite to Java, which is a compiled language, you don't have to compile the code to run it. You can run it on any computer. Uh, it runs on an environment that you install. Uh, in this class, which is suggested to, uh, for you guys to install Anaconda as the environment uh, to use Python for. Uh, the reason for that is because Anaconda already comes pre-installed with a lot of packages that you guys are going to be using. If it's your first time using Python, it is the easiest way to get started. Um, by installing Anaconda, you already install NumPy, Pandas and all those packages that you're going to be using in the class anyways. Uh, the Python version that we're going to be using in this class, it's going to be 3.6, 3.7. Um, so I think it will be fine if you use uh, the two point, if you use uh, Python 2 to do these assignments, but just make sure uh, at the end before you submit, you change your code version to 3.7 so that the auto grade doesn't give you an error because one of the syntaxes does not work in 3.7 or 3.6. Um, okay, if it's your first time using Jupyter Notebook and Python, Jupyter Notebook is an IDE for Python. And the reason we use Jupyter Notebook instead of other IDEs is because it's just easier to prototype with. As you can see later on, I'm gonna show in this uh, introduction, um, you would have multiple cells that you can run codes on and they're kind of independent of each other. Uh, the variables are gonna move along in the memory, but you can also change things uh, between cells, which makes it super easy for our course because we're gonna be using a lot of plotting, a lot of different things that it will be a headache if you use other IDs, you have to keep copying the code and pasting it in different environments to do it. So it's just easier to use Jupyter Notebook for prototyping. At the end of your assignment, you're most likely gonna be converting it to a Python uh, to a normal Python file, um, and that's super easy. I can show you later on how to do that, and then just submit the file. All right, so let's get started. So first thing first, what's the difference in Python and Java? As I said, Java needs to get compiled, and it is uh, statis uh, statically typed. Means that you can't um, change the type of the variable in the middle, but, and you don't have to uh, in Java, you have to declare types of variables, but in Python, you don't have to. You can just go ahead right away, just write x is equal to 3, it knows, it's an int. So it's going to go over and do that. Um, and the other thing is, when you're uh, instating classes in Python, you don't have to say, you don't use new, you just pretty much come up, you just write the class with the instances you want to mention, and just write, uh, if you have a class person, you can just emulate 25, that's the name, maybe that's the age and it can just uh, initiate uh, a new instance in the class. And the other thing is uh, Python does not use parentheses like Java, instead um, uses white spacing for the scope of the method, for, for loops. And um, functions cannot be overloaded um, and uh, instead we use optimal arguments, as you can see here. And the Boolean values on Python are true and false and null is none in Python. I don't know why, but they just decided, I guess, null is not good enough. And I think a lot of you guys might be familiar with MATLAB. Who here has worked in MATLAB before? Okay, most of you. <laughs> so um, there are some differences between Python and MATLAB. Uh, the biggest thing is MATLAB indexing starts with zero. Uh, a Python indexing starts with zero, but MATLAB starts with one. So just take care of that one you're coding, and then Python uses hard brackets for indexing, matrices instead of uh, parentheses. And um, Python doesn't come, as I said, with full packages. In MATLAB, you can do whatever, it's all pre-installed, but in Python, you may have to install new packages to do different things. Most of the capabilities you have in 
um, MATLAB can be done using NumPy on Python. So just know that. We're going to go through NumPy uh, later in the uh, presentation. OK. So if you guys, I think you all know how to initiate Jupyter Notebook. But if you don't, just go to your local machine. Um, uh, you're starting a server on your local machine and hosting it. So when you are doing this in Anaconda, you just bring, uh, bring up Anaconda prompt. And wherever you are, just write Jupyter Notebook, initiates it. It brings up, um, it makes a server and client and brings up environment you can uh, write and make Jupyter Notebook files. So start a file. So basics. As I said before, this is the way you initiate variables. Um, you don't have to write their type. Um, all the you know is the first one is float. Uh, you have int, and then you have a string. Um, and in the middle, you want to change a variable type. You don't have to do anything. Just pretty much change it. Automatically changes it. So y used to be an int. Now it's a string. You don't have to do anything. Just write it as a string. It changes it. And um, as I said before, the null type is a none in Python. So you can just write none, and that's, that counts as a null. Um, in Python, equal shows if you want to set a variable, and then double equals checks for truth of that variable. So in this case, we're checking if z is none, and in this case is, so it's going to give us a true. Um, you can also cast super easily on Python. Um, if you have 140, which is a string in this case, you can just say int, and it becomes an int. If you want to make it a float, um, this string becomes a float. And then you, if, you become, if you want to make uh, the, the int here into a string, you just write str and make it into a string. OK, so let's start with strings. So we have these two strings. Uh, we can easily find the length of the string using len. Uh, that just gives you the length. Um, you can also use indexing, static indexing. Um, just as I said before, uh, uses brackets. So we're using bracket 0. Uh, indexing starts from 0, so in this case, it's going to print A. Um, if you say 1, it's going to be B, and 5, it's going to be um, F. Now, if you go out of bound with indexing, it's going to give you an error that, that is out of bound, so that's convenient. And make sure you're always in bound, and that probably is going to happen at the beginning. If you've been working on MATLAB, you, it's going to be hard to rewire your brain to think from 0 indexing, so you're probably going to go out of bound multiple times but um, it's going to give you an error, so you'll be fine. Um, you can also do negative indexing. Um, so you can say s minus 1, and it starts from the end. Um, so in this case, minus 1, it's going to give you f. Minus 2 is going to give you e, and so on. Now, if you do um, double columns, what it does is that um, it goes from the back and prints out the whole string in flip mode, I guess. So it goes from the back, reads it, all of the, all of the items in a string. So in this case, it would be F, E, D, C, B, A. And that's why it prints. And you can also do slicing, which means that in here, you have print S from 1 to, let's say, 100. It chooses string uh, index 1 all the way to the end. In this case, it's not going to give you an error because it's going to get to, let's say, the fifth index, and that is the last index. And there is nothing else afterwards. It's going to give you whatever exists in, until whatever index that exists. So in this case, 100 doesn't exist. But it gives you from 1 to the end of the string. Um, concatenation is also super easy. You can just add string to other strings and just append it to the end of it. So in this case, uh, we, we append x, y, z to s. And it becomes a, b, c, d, e, f, x, y, z. Um, you can also, when you're trying to append, let's say, one, two, three, you have to obviously change it to a string, and then just add it, and it appends super easily. Um, splitting, um, the way it works is that you call this split method on your string, and you say, based on what you're trying to do to split, in this case, you want to do it based on C, finds the C, and then splits the string to two parts, so A, B, and D, E, F. If I run this. All this stuff that I said happens. Um, if at any point I'm going too fast, if you have any questions, just ask. Um, and we can just help uh, take care of your confusion. All right, let's get, let's get to lists. Uh, this is how you initiate a list. 
Um, list can be empty. You can have empty list. Yes. It's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, not the actual thing, yeah. Not like a direct, direct way to do it, but yeah, you can get smart. <clears throat> okay, so this is how you initiate an empty list. Um, len is used for strings, lists, everything, so we can find the length of this uh, string of the list. And you can do the same exact thing with indexing. Uh, negative indexing goes from the end, and positive indexing does the same thing as we did in the string. Uh, we can sort the list. I believe the sort uh, method on Python uses quick sort, but I'm not sure exactly. Um, so um, just don't take my word. If you want to know exactly how it does it, uh, search about it. And you can do reverse true, and it reverses it. So instead of the, in, the actual sorted method goes from small to large, you can go large to small by using inverse. And um, you can append to the end of the um, list. So in this case, you just append a dot append, and it appends 10. It doesn't give you anything back. It just appends it to the list. Um, or you can just do uh, pluses. You can equal pluses. This means a is equal to a plus whatever uh, list you're adding. It, this also appends um, to the end of the list and does not return anything. Um, in lists, you don't have to have the same data types in Python, so you can have strings, and at the end of it, you can just add string. Uh, you can have um, ints, and at the end, you can just add a string. So in this case, we're appending machine learning to um, A, and by adding it, you can see at the end, we just have machine learning, and uh, it's a string type, and the rest are string, uh, rest are ints. And you can easily check if a, a value is in a list by just searching for that value, let's say A in A, uh, 8 in A, and it gives you a true if it exists. It gives you false if it doesn't. It is super intuitive, super easy, just pretty much pure English. You can do it in Python. Um, let me just find. Can you make it bigger? Oh, uh, yeah. Give me one sec. Is it good? No. Not good? <laughs> good? If I go bigger, I feel like it would be hard to. A bit more? I can go. Okay, let me go that one down. Okay, can everyone see now? All right, cool. Okay, let's, over, let's go over dictionaries. So this is how you create an empty dictionary in Python. And um, you can just assign a key and value using, just say, D, uh, with this key item has this value. Um, you can print it and you can print specific values using the key. Uh, and again, we use brackets, so just make sure you use brackets. And um, you can, again, Python is super open. You can have different types of keys. They don't have to be the same type. So in this case, we have type int as the key, and we are assigning um, a list for that specific key. So you can do that also. Um, using the keys method, you can find all the keys in your dictionary, and using the uh, values method, you can find all the values that exist in your dictionary. So by printing keys and values here, you can just see all different keys that exist in the dictionary and all the values that exist in the dictionary. Um, you can check by pretty much searching, and again, the, the way we did in lists, you can just say um, A in D, and if it's true, it, it gives you a true, if it doesn't exist, it gives you a false. And you can delete um, an item from your uh, dictionary by just using del. And it, it modifies it in place. It doesn't return anything to you. So I'm just going to run this. All right, let's go through if statements. So in Python, you don't really require any parentheses. You can just say a, b, 
7, 10, A is going to be equal to 7, and B is going to be equal to 10. And if you want to check for a quality, as I said, use double equal. So you're checking here if A is equal to 7. Um, if it is true, it's going to uh, print yes. And if it isn't, it's going to equal, it's going to return no. Um, and not equal is this. So I think it's the same in all languages. And you can check for two conditions by using and or or. Um, super intuitive. You can say if A is bigger than 5 and and <laughs> B is less than or equal to 10, uh, it goes to the if statement and it prints 1, 2, and, and else. And in Python, for some reason, else if is elif. Um, so just use that. That's your else if. Um, and you can obviously use or, so and and or, um, to check for different conditions. Um, you would also use the same double equal sign for strings. Uh, in some languages, it might be different. But in Python, you just use double equal. And in this case, you're saying is s equal abc, and it is. And it's going to print here. OK. Let's go through for loops. So the range method, what it does is that, so let's say we have A as a list. Uh, the range method just creates a list that um, goes from 1 to 5. And you can write the same, if you do, if you do range 5, it starts from 0 and goes all the way before 5. So it usually is the case in Python that the last item is not included. So if you have, let's say, range 5, it goes from 0 to 4. And if you have range 1 to 5, it's going to have 1, 2, 3, 4. So the first element is going to be included. The last element wouldn't. So in range, it would be five items. And in range from 1 to 5, it initializes from 1, and it goes all the way to 4. So it will be four items. So this is the way we usually write loops. This is a standard way. You go for i in, as I said, range creates a list. Um, and length of a, in this case, is 5. So it goes from indexing from 0 to 4 and prints all the items in this list. I'll wait for a minute, just because it's a bit more. Um, you can directly go to the list. Instead of finding indexes, you can just say for x in a, um, it goes for item by item in the list, and it just prints it, if you don't need the indexing. Um, you can do the same thing in dictionaries. Uh, you have, let's say, this dictionary here. And you can use the key and value pair um, using the uh, dot items method and go through all key and value pairs and print it or do different things to it. And uh, if you want both the index and the value of let's say a list or whatever you're iterating through, you can just use uh, the enumerate method and you just go through all index items. It prints both of them. It gives you both index and that item itself. So, so yeah, it gives you the first item is index, second item is a value, index one is a, two, three, go all the way. Uh, OK, so let's go through methods and functions. So in Python, you define a method or function by just using def. You put, um, again, you don't have to do any type of input output type. You just pretty much define a function or a method, and you just call it, let's say, add. The inputs are x and y, and you just return whatever you're trying to return. Um, and this is, uh, for example, a function that just adds two numbers. Uh, this concat, as I showed before, Using a plus and two strings, just concatenate the two strings. So in here, we're just uh, getting list one and adding list two and concatenate it together to the end of it. So this is an example. Uh, you can also add arguments by the name. You can just say y equal eight and x equal two, and then input it in. Or you can just directly go three and four. Um, it takes three as a first argument and four as a second argument and do it. Um, so. Besides strings, you can also use it in lists, as I showed you before. So in 0, 1, 3, 4, if you concatenate it, it's just going to give you 0, 1, and 3, 5 as a list. You can also return two outputs. So in this case, you have A, an input, and then you're adding one and adding two and returning two items um, out of the 
a method. So this is the way you do it. You just put right here, and then you just return two different um, outputs from that method and function. So in this case, A3 and A4, if you input one, it gives you two and three as the outputs. Um, you can also, um, so T is gonna be in this case a tuple, so there are two items that are gonna return. You can just directly um, check this first and the second item by using this, um, T0 and T1. Okay. Let's go through compression, uh, list compressions and dic uh, dictionary compressions. Um, so I, I showed you for loops and I showed you what I can do with them. Uh, in this case, let's go through this example. This add one just takes a number and <coughs> adds one to it. Uh, so in this case, you have X is this and Y is an empty list and you're going through every item in X and appending it to Y, adding one to it. So in this case, who, what do you think the output would be? Anyone wants to? Just have a go at it and then tell me what the output of this method is gonna be. Yeah, so it takes every item in the list and adds one to it and it appends it to Y, so Y is gonna be one, two, three, four. Now you can write the same thing in a list compression. Um, the reason you use list compressions, uh, they are faster than a normal loop. So what you do is, it might be a bit counterintuitive at the beginning, but as you go through it, it's actually a very uh, structured way to write it. So you write what you're exactly trying to do first, and then you say for what item you're trying to do this. So you say you want to add one to xi for xi that is in x. So it's kind of flipped. You are going, xi is the item in the list, um, X is the list and you're adding one to it. And that is equal to Y. So that all does depending on everything. So this is one way to do it. Uh, you can have conditions too in your list compression. You can say, okay, Y2, XI need to be added to Y2 for every item in the list that is called X, but you wanna make sure that XI is bigger than one. So if, if and only if X is bigger than one, is going to be appended to Y as it's going through the list. Uh, you can do the same thing for dictionaries. Um, so you can say XI, XI, this is the key and this is the value. Um, you want the value three times four for every item in X. So what it does is that it goes through every item in X and it creates a key and a value pair and value is gonna be four times the key. So, this is the way to do it, I'm gonna run it. So yeah, it gets this as an output and um, you can find a second item or you can find um, the item in the dictionary that has key two by just calling two and in here you can see it's eight so it's gonna print eight. Okay. Now let's go over files, how to open files. So we're gonna have a txt file. Uh, has everyone, like, do you guys have the files downloaded? If not, it's fine, I'll show you the txt file. Uh, okay, so this is a txt file I have. It is just three lines, it says hi, this is awesome, right? And I wanna load this into a variable in Python. So how would I do this? You see there's spacing here. So let's see. Okay, so I first, obviously, I initiate a list uh, called lines. I open the file using the open method, and R just indicates you just wanna read it. You don't wanna do anything else to it. And um, you, you name that as F, and then you go through every line in F for line in F. Um, you wanna use the strip method because strips take care of all the spacing before and after every line in the list, so in the, in the case we had, we had high, had space at the beginning, you don't want that spacing, so you just use the strip and remove the spacing before and after every um, string or every item you have in your txt file. 
And uh, the upper method just makes sure that they're all uppercase um, letters, so they're just gonna add it. And then at the end of it, we just append that two lines. So based on this, we can just see um, this is just gonna be, how many items are gonna have in the list for this? Yeah, we're gonna have three items, and um, there's gonna be no spacing before and after, but this spacing is gonna be there. So this, and this spacing is going to be there. So if I run it, um, so yeah. And obviously it uses to uppercase it, so this is the uppercase version of whatever we had. And at the end of it, if you wanna save the file, whatever you had, you just um, use the same method you used before, but you use W, which means write. So it writes it into an output.txt file and um, closes it. Or you can just uh, output the word high. It outputs it, and at the end you have to close it. And if I go, yes? Um, it, can, it can be anything. Yeah. So let me just show you what the output is. So this is the output, same method the way we wrote it. Um, every item in the list is gonna be a new line. So if you had like five items, it's gonna be five new lines. And, oops. So if you go back. Now, Okay, actually, I was wrong. <laughs> it only accepts strings as, as an output. Uh, you can use NumPy, there are other versions, you can use NumPy to use strings, um, but um, you can just search about that. Just search NumPy, how to write. There's also a different option for write and I can give a list of strings. Yeah, but yeah, the, the, uh, the open method only uses strings for it. Okay. Um, so let's go over classes. Okay, in this is the way this is the way you create a class in Python. Um, is a constructor all instances of the method. Um, so after you create, let's say, class person, every other um, methods in that class have to take self as an argument. The first argument of every method in that class would be self. Um, and it's the way for the language to know it has access to all, um, the, all, the, all the different instances in that specific class. So in this case, you have self name, and if your input is adult self, it would know all different, it would know name and age and everything. But you, you don't have a choice, you have to have self as an input for every method in, um, in a class in Python. Uh, and it's similar to Java with this, it's this in Java. Um, so in this case, the init method is the way to initialize the class. So we use, use this, if you were calling person, you want name and age, and that's how you initialize the class with like different instances. So you, you need name and age to do this. And every single method here can have the dynamic and static methods. If you have dynamic methods, you itself. Um, you can have static methods to not even use any of the variables in your object and um, do different type of calculations for the stuff that doesn't really require the init, uh, the init uh, method in the class. So in this case, in the is adult is checking if the age of the person is uh, bigger than 18. If it is, it's gonna give true. If not, it's gonna give false. And is child is exactly opposite. <laughs> so if it's not, uh, is adult, then it's, <laughs> then it's a child. And um, you can do different things. You can increment age. Uh, you can just pretty much self-add amount you want to add to it. So if you have the age wrong, you can just add something to it, and this does the same thing. Um, you can also call the EQ uh, method here, and what it does, it pretty much uh, checks if uh, two people have the same age or whatever you're trying to find. Uh, it goes for initialization, let's say in this case, name and age, and it checks if these two um, instances have the same initialization. Okay, so in this, let's start with person, Bob, and, and 19. So there's 
uh, we call we create an instance with name Bob and age 19. Sorry. Now we're checking. So let me run this first. Now we're checking if uh, we are printing Bob's name and age, and it's going to print Bob and 19. And we can check if Bob is an adult uh, by uh, calling this method, and it gives us yes or no. And we can add one to the age by just saying p dot increment age one. It adds one to the age. It used to be 19. Now it's going to be 20. We can uh, initiate a different uh, instance person. Uh, her name is Mary, and her age is 30. And uh, we can check if these two different instances are the same. It checks by going to initialization. It, che it checks by going to this method automatically and checks if uh, the initialized value are the same. So in this case, they are not the same. So it's going to give you a false. And um, if you, again, call make a different person with this name and this age, obviously this is the same person. So it's going to give you a true. Yeah, super intuitive. I thought everything is easy. OK, so now let's go through packages. Uh, two packages that I'm going to go through are NumPy and uh, scikit-learn. And then Roshan is going to go over pandas. So these three packages are probably mostly using the class. There is one more package, going to be PyTorch, we're going to be using for the deep learning assignments. But that's later on the, uh, in, the, in the class, so we're not going to go over it now. OK, so you can use a random package to just generate random numbers. Um, it's the best way to do it. You can call it a seed. Uh, I think you guys did this in the quiz. If you did the quiz, I had a specific seed. It's going to always give you that, uh, the same output. So you use seed to make sure that people ha don't have different results. Um, obviously, it's useful because you have a quiz. I don't want everyone to have a different answer. So I had to use a specific seed. So that's how you initiate a seed. And um, you can just uh, call the rand int method for the random. And it creates a random number between 1 and 5, an integer random number. And if you don't do that, it's just called random. It creates a random, a float random from 0 to 1. Uh, so uh, you can do that. And then you can use a shuffle, which is going to be useful sometimes in your assignments, to shuffle the list. Um, just goes through every index and shuffles it. So, um, and it, it shuffles it in place. And it doesn't return you a copy. Um, so shuffled it and that and everything else. And the seed is 4, so everyone, someone else use it use the same exact information with this seed, it's going to give you the same exact output. Uh, now NumPy. Um, if you use Anaconda, you already have NumPy installed. But if you didn't use Anaconda and you have um, using a different environment, then make sure to pip install NumPy. Just go to your, um, uh, you pretty much, if you have Anaconda, you go to Anaconda Prom. If you have Linux or um, Mac, just go to your, a normal terminal, and then uh, pip install NumPy. If you have Windows, I don't know. Just figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> just install Anaconda. It's easier. <laughs> OK, so NumPy. So you import, this is how you import different packages in Python. You import NumPy, but since you don't want to call NumPy every time as NumPy, it's, you know, people usually write it as NP. And every time you call it NP, NumPy is going to be called. So we're calling NumPy as NP. And if you do the zeros method, it um, just creates a vector of length uh, 5. And it's going to be all zeros. So zeros um, with the length 5, indexing from 0. And dot shape method gives you the shape of a vector or array. So in this case, it's going to be 1D. It's going to give you um, 5 and nothing. It's a one-dimensional array. And uh, it's going to return a tuple. If, um, in this case, it's going to be, if you want to find a first or first dimension uh, shape, you just do v dot shape, and you're looking at the first dimension. And in this case, it's 5. If you do a 1, it doesn't exist. We give you an error. So there's, there's no uh, second dimension. You can assign specific values to uh, specific indices in Python. So in this case, v of 0, you want to assign it as 1 and v of 1, so it goes to index 0, and it puts it as 1, and it goes to index 1, and it puts it at 4. So now the list is going to be 0, 1, 0, 0, 4, 0. 
Um, you can do the same thing you did with lists. Um, you can just go from the second index. So okay, actually I'm gonna ask you a question. So what, is, what does this do? So which indices in V are going to change by calling this? Okay, so yeah, so two, three, four, fifth, there's no, well, obviously this list doesn't have a fifth, but if it did have a fifth, just make sure the last item is not gonna be included. So it's gonna be two, three, four. NumPy also has a random uh, method, so you can use that np.random, ran to create a random number, uh, and this creates a vector um, between zero and one with length five. So this five here is the length of the array, and uh, random just creates a random number between zero and one. You can compute dot products super easily by just doing np dot and uh, do a dot product between v and v1. If you wanna do element-wise multiplication, you just use the multiply uh, that, uh, that Python has, or you can use uh, np.multiply, and this does the same thing. So numpy multiply is the same as um, just doing the multiply sign right here. And if you do plus and multiply, they do the same thing. They do um, element-wise. So if, you, if one of them is a scalar, it just distributes it to every item in that array, and if they're both um, vectors, it's going to be element-wise, and if they don't have the same shape, then it's gonna give you an error. So if you have two different vectors that have different shapes, it doesn't know what to do, so make sure it either has the same length, or it's the same shape, or one of them is a scalar. So if I run this, okay, and yeah, so these items where the random numbers are created, so these are random numbers from zero and one, and um, this is uh, when I multiply v in here was a vector and five is in scalar, so every item in five, every item in v are going to multiply by five, and every item in v is going to be added three two, so easy to, easy enough. Um, so matrices are pretty much 2D arrays, uh, it's kind of like a list of a list, but in NumPy are represented in an array. Um, so if three, if T is just a tuple three, four, you can just input that to np.ones, that ones method uses that tuple and creates a 2D array, which means three is gonna be, this is the easiest way to think about it as a matrix. Um, two is, uh, three is gonna be the number of rows and four is gonna be the number of columns. Um, so if you do the shape, in this case, it's gonna return three and four. And if you do shape zero, it's gonna give you a number of rows, and shape one is gonna give you a number of columns for that specific array. Um, you can do the same thing with that when you had one dimensional array. You can just assign values by giving you exactly where you wanna go. So you wanna go to the first row, and um, first row means obviously second row, because indexing starts from zero. So the second row and fourth column is gonna be equal to eight in this item, in this case. And when you do this right here, um, you are pretty much saying that you want, well this is actually the wrong, this is not the first row, this is gonna be the second row, because indexing starts from zero. So it is going to be the second row and all different columns you have. So it's gonna go through every single item. So you can easily find a specific row. This just says every item, every item in that, that has this specific um, row index. And you can do the same exact thing with, um, with the other way around. So you can say all, so the third column with every single row item. So this is gonna give you the row, the row, row uh, third row. You can use this to assign, so let's say you wanna say the second row is equal to this now. Now you gotta make sure that obviously you have the same number of items, so if you're the shape, if you have more than four columns or less than four columns, this gives you an error because you can't really input that into, um, into the matrix. So if this was any other thing, um, so let's say if I run this now, it's gonna assign it. But if I change this to, oh, they actually did add it. I didn't add it. Oh no, it didn't add, okay, I was confused. Okay, 
Um, so yeah, it gives you an error because you cannot really add that to the, to the array. And you can create an array or a matrix just using NP as array. And um, this is going to be your first row. This is going to be your second row. Um, did I skip over things? One second. Okay, yeah, so let me just. Okay, so I showed you the rand method in NumPy creates a one dimensional uh, of a specific size of random numbers. If you do two items here, so if you do four or five, it's gonna give you two dimensional with four number, of, four rows and five, five columns of random numbers from zero and one. And if you use uh, mat new, you can do dot product. It's the same thing as dot. Um, I think one of them is older. I think Mule is an older method. They are using dot product now. Um, but Mule is also possible to do different matrix multiplication. You can find a transpose by just calling transpose or T. And that transposes if X obviously is a NumPy, uh, NumPy type. Um, as I showed before, this is the way you create a NumPy, um, NumPy array. You just say um, NumPy np dot as array, and it gives you, um, it changes the type to, so these are two lists, and now this is gonna be uh, two rows and three columns, NumPy array. So if you print this, it's going to be, yeah, it's gonna be this, zero, one, two, three, four, five. If you wanna make zeros, uh, Zero is array of size, five rows and three columns, you just do this, gives a tuple and it creates it. If you make ones, every item is gonna be one now of the same size. The I just creates an identity matrix and it puts, uh, and the size of it is gonna be five. So it's gonna be a five by five, which every diagonal is gonna be one because it's identity. So it's gonna give you identity matrix of size five, five. And we, we, we talked to this again as rand gives you random numbers. And rand int gives you an integer, um, random number uh, from one to four. So the first item is gonna be the uh, first, uh, your lower bound, and the four is gonna be your upper bound, and five, five and three are going to be um, the size of the array. Okay, all right, let's go through a scalar. Um, so I think I'm gonna be super quick in this because probably you haven't done much machine learning yet. Uh, so it maybe doesn't make sense as much, but we'll be using this for initial assignments to do uh, training and prediction and everything. Um, I think sklearn is already installed in Anaconda. If it's not, you just pip install sklearn, super easy. Um, you can, it, there are different types of models. Let's say we're using a SGD classifier. If, it doesn't, if this doesn't make any sense to you now, it's fine because we haven't really gone through it. But just to know, this is one classifier you can use. So we are importing that classifier. Um, X in here is our training data. So these are different features that we have and each row can be an example. So we have, in this case, seven examples and each example has four features. If none of these make sense, it's fine because we haven't gone through any of this. Um, and then Y can be our labels, zero and one, whatever the label is going to be. And you can just create a classifier super easily, what type of loss you want, and what type of penalty you want. You create it, and then you do dot .fit, which trains the model super easily. Uh, using X, first element is gonna be your training, and, and Y is gonna be your label. And then you can uh, then, obviously, let's say this is our test data. These are the examples we wanna know what the label is for. You pretty much do, you call the classifier, which is CLF, we called it earlier and do dot .predict and uh, see what the labels are gonna be based on the data you've seen before. And let's assume that after this calling white pred, you get some result back, and why this is actually your, your actual label, then you can easily go through the, um, through the uh, items in the list and see if they're correct or not. So if you run this, Takes a bit more, I guess. Okay. Okay, so it, what it did, it trained, and then it took all these test items and inputted it into the model and predicted what the labels 
should be and use the labels, whatever the labels were. Actually, I'm going to predict, I'm going to print it here. OK, so it predicted to be first example to be 0, second example to be 0, and the last example to be 1. But in reality, it's 0, 1, 1. So we have one wrong. So that's why our accuracy is 66%, 0.666%. Um, and you can go through this and see how we calculated it. Number of correct divided by the total times 100. And now Roshan is going to go over pandas. Um, that's another package that is useful to know. Hello. Yeah. Uh, is this good enough? Yeah. So uh, we'll be covering pandas, which is supposed to be the the primary package that you use when working with uh, data processing or machine learning. So to start off, um, the basic building blocks of Pandas includes series and data frames. So uh, what you see over here is the basic definition on how you can actually initialize a series and a data frame. So you can think of series to be uh, like a 1D array of values. In this case, it's uh, football, basketball, volleyball, and tennis. And you have another definition in which you have values, but you also have specific index assigned to each value. So you can see that when you run this. So this is how a series looks like. It's just a 1D uh, uh, array of values. And since we did not define any particular index for it, pandas by default assigns uh, like just numbers starting from 0 to 3. In the case of population, since we did define an uh, index, you will see that each of these values is also accompanied by a particular index associated with it. And uh, this is uh, how you actually define a data frame. So it has a different, slightly different syntax. You have a map architecture in which you give the name of the variable followed by the list of values. So you have the variable name country and then the list of values. Then so you have population, area, and capital. So when you print it out, this is what it looks like. So you can see the difference in how the output actually comes out. So this is how a series looks like, and this is what a data frame looks like. The key thing which you should know is that a data frame is actually built up of a lot of series objects. So you can confirm that by actually using the type operator. So if you run type on population, it tells you that uh, this is an object of Panda series. If you run it on countries, it tells you that's a data frame. But if you take a specific column from within this data frame object, it'll tell you that it's again a series. So data frame is basically a lot of series objects put in together. So uh, whether it's a series or a data frame, you'll always have an index associated with it. And you can retrieve that index using the index um, like 
argument over here. So sports.index over here is range index. This is what uh, gets defined by default if you do not provide it an index. And in case of population, since we did define indices, we get the actual values that we provided it. So one of the ways that you can actually pull out values or make use of indices is that you can specify which index is that you want and you can give it within square brackets and you can retrieve the exact value you want. Then you also have the values method through which you can extract the entire uh, values present in a series or a data frame as a NumPy object. So within your series, all your data set is actually stored as a NumPy. And that's one of the reasons why we want you to be familiar with NumPy as well. Because if you're actually manipulating Pandas data frames, at its core, you have NumPy. Then you can have very trivial computations on uh, series by just saying divide by 100. You actually can like manipulate the series uh, in place itself. So yeah, if you actually run type on the population.values, you can see that the values output is actually as I said, a NumPy array. So one of the ways that you can actually access variables in your data frame is using the dot operator. So we know that area is one of the variables, one of the columns in your data frame. So we can actually access that using the dot operator. So if you just give countries.area, you get the particular variable. So dot is one of the ways that you can access a particular variable. So if you give countries.area, and then again values on top of it, you will get the values as a NumPy array. So in terms of very basic trivial uh, say methods which you should be familiar with, uh, the first one is columns. It basically lists out all the, um, the variable names in your data frame. D types will give you the variable names along with the type of um, each variable. So in this case, country is of type object. That's because it's strings. Population is a float, area is an integer, and capital again is object. Head is something which you use just to kind of get a peek at your data set. So when you say head three, it basically gives you the top three rows in your data frame. So if you have a file that's you know one GB big, you do not want to run something like this. Because when you run this, it will basically output the entire data frame. And if you have something that's really big, uh, printing out the entire thing will probably like crash your system. So it's always a good idea to just use head instead. Then you have the describe function, which basically gives you statistics on your numerical variables from count, mean, standard deviation, and like an entire distribution of your values. Again, the values function gives out your entire, uh, the entire value in your data frame as a 2D NumPy array. You have the info function, which gives you sort of the same information. Uh, the only thing you get in, um, like in addition to the other methods is that it tells you how many non-null values you have, and also the memory usage for each of your data frames. So value counts is another function which you'll be using a lot. So um, essentially, it tells you the number of time a unique value in a variable has been there. So in this case, we know that Brussels, London, all, this, all of these values have been repeated just once. That's why you have the count of one against here. Um, yeah. So. Uh, as you can see over here, we have a series in which the values are listed over here, and then we have the index on the other side. If you actually want to move the index and make it a variable as such, you can use the reset index method. So as you can see right now, the values that were previously there as an index have now become an actual value. And as you can see, it's no longer a series, it's a data frame. That's why the change in the format itself. And uh, since you have removed the index over here, Pandas now assigns the default index, which is just numbers from 0 to 4. So you can actually confirm that what you have right now is a data frame by using the type operator. So you can see that right now, after using reset in index, you no longer have a series, but you have a data frame. So even if you have the output of value counts, which was something like this, right? Right now, this is a series. If you actually want to you know, make it into a data frame, which would help you in 
um, you know, processing which down the line, uh, you can actually use reset index to the output of value counts, and you'll get the output as a data frame itself. So the next important part would be like selecting and filtering your data set. So um, the two primary ways that you can actually do is using the lock and ilock operator, but there are um, other ways as well by which you can you know, filter and select your data set. So for this, we'll be using the train uh, PDF, uh, CSV. And if you look at the, if you look at the top few rows over here, it's essentially the Titanic data set. So you have the passenger ID, whether the person survived or not, the name, and a bunch of other variables. So uh, the easiest way to retrieve um, a variable from your data frame is using the square brackets. Um, so if you use the square brackets and provide the class name over here, you can get the values associated with that particular variable. If you want to get multiple columns, there's something which you cannot do with the dot operator. If you want to select multiple columns, then you can provide a list of the variables that you're interested in. So if you provide like two variables over here within a list, then you can retrieve both of them together. So yeah, um, we'll be focusing on lock and ilock. Um, for most applications, uh, you would probably rely on lock. ilock is very rarely used. That's because if your index is just the default index that goes from zero to whatever, um, lock can essentially do all the job, all the work that ilock can do. Uh, so most of the time you'd be working with lock, but in few cases you might have to rely on ilock. So um, the broad definition is that lock does selection by labels and ilock does selection by position. And this over here is the default or like the primary syntax, how you're supposed to use it. Um, so right now over here, we are using lock and we're giving two parameters. We're giving four and then the variable named fair. So what happens over here is that the first argument is used to select which row it is that you are interested in. And the second argument uh, tells pandas which column it is that you're interested in. So when you run this, you'll be getting 8.05 which corresponds to the fourth element, fourth row, and the fair column. Uh, another thing to remember is that in this case, when I say fourth row, it's actually, uh, if you count from the first one, it's actually the fifth one. So the indexing starts from zero. So when you say four over here, it's actually pulling out the fifth uh, row from your data frame. You can pass conditions to it. So right now you're saying that I want all, um, rows which satisfy this condition. So if you run that, you can see that only the rows which satisfy this particular condition are retrieved. You can add a column condition on top of that. So I want this condition to be satisfied as well as the fact that I just need uh, the fair for all these rows. So again, this retrieves um, only the fares of all female passengers. Another way that you can make use of this is pro like uh, providing a list of variables. So in this case, you can actually provide the three variables that you're interested in, and it'll give you back exactly that, just the three variables, and also make sure that this condition is being satisfied. So uh, there is another way that you can actually do the same thing. Instead of actually providing the list of variables inside lock, you can provide it outside lock as well. So this seems to give you the same result. So one of the things that you should be aware of pandas is that there are multiple ways of doing the exact same thing. But uh, behind the scene, one process might be doing a lot more work than the other. So it's important to understand which one can, you know, uh, does the work in a much better way. So if you look at these two situations, in the first case where you use lock and provide the list of variables which you are interested in, it specifically picks out just those three columns. But what's happening over here is that you're doing two operations. The first operation will retrieve all rows which satisfy this condition, as well as all the columns. And to the output of the first argument over here, you provide the uh, list of variables that you're interested in. 
So what happens is that you actually pull in all the columns, which would be like a huge amount of data, and then do a subset. So even though these two would give you the same exact output, the, the backend process involved in this is actually different. So you have to make sure that uh, the syntax that you're using is actually the most efficient one. Yeah, so um, iLock uh, basically does the same thing as lock. It's just that it relies on the actual position of elements. So when you say iLock.4, it gives you the fourth, um, like the row which has the index uh, corresponding to four. So the place, again, you can give five to seven, it'll give you rows five and six. The place where it fails is in situations like this. Where you give it a variable name, it'll give you an error that says, can only index by location with a list of conditions. Whether it can be an integer or an integer slice, list-like of integers. So these are the only ways through which you can use iLock. If you give something like the name of a, a variable, it will not work. You can, however, do something similar to what we just did previously. Take out the fifth and sixth row, and to the output of that, give the fair column. So you can still make it work, but as I said, this is not the best way computationally. You can also give a random list of uh, row indices. So it will give you specifically that. Um, yeah, I think this is, lock also does the same thing. So essentially, if your indices are just the, the default indices going from zero to the number of elements in your uh, data frame, Log can essentially do the same thing as iLog. So you can also use log for assigning values. So in this case, you are creating a new copy of uh, your data frame, and you're assigning the first row, which has the index zero, and the fair column, a value of minus 100. So as you can see over here, we could change the value of that particular cell block that we are interested in. To create new variables, the easiest method is to just define the new variable name that you're interested in and provide the list of values. The thing that you should keep uh, in mind is that the list of values that you provide over here should be of the same length as the number of rows in your data frame. So this will work. This will not. So you have to keep that in mind before you do this. Uh, you can also use existing columns, make some computation out of it, and assign it to your new variable. So we created a new variable based on existing columns. So one of the more powerful methods that you can use to create new variables is the apply method. So um, in this case, we are trying to create a variable called capital upper. And the syntax for this is um, what you see over here. So you take the variable based on which you are going to create the new variable. You use the apply method. And within apply, you basically use the syntax. So um, lambda is just a keyword for defining one line functions. So in this case, x is your argument, that is your input, and the output is going to be x dot upper. So when you run this, you can see that all values in the pre-existing capital variable have now been uh, passed through the uppercase function and have been put as a new variable called capital upper. So that was just a very you know, uh, naive example for how to use apply. Uh, a much more, say, a more complex example would be using something like this. So if you have age and you want to create age buckets, you can define a method which essentially takes a single value and outputs which bucket does this belong to. So over here, we are creating the age bucket variable. We use the same syntax as before. Take the age variable, apply, the lambda function, and we say that for all input values, apply the age bucket function. So you can see over here that based on the age, you have the age buckets assigned. So this is actually a quite a powerful method through which you can you know, create really uh, difficult or like complex features. Um, so till now, we have been using apply on the variable directly. You can also use it on the entire data frame as such. 
So if you want to create a variable that uses more than one column in your data frame, you can use apply on the data frame itself and pass specific variables that you're interested in. So in this case, you are taking just the age variable from your entire row and passing it to your age bucket. And the only differentiator here is that you add the axis one, which tells the apply method that I am applying this across every row of your data frame. If you put axis equal to zero, you can apply the function across every column. So it provides that flexibility. So while applying uh, the apply method across the entire data frame, you get something like this. So that's another way where you can use the apply function. And the advantage here is that you can create a new variable using multiple existing columns. So uh, group by is another um, commonly used uh, function. So um, when you take a data frame and uh, group it by a particular variable, the output that you get is a data frame group by object. So to these objects, you can call several predefined methods. You can call the mean, you can call the max, you can call the sum, and so on. So uh, the number of like predefined functions that you have is quite limited. It's just mean, max, min, sum, count, etc. Uh, so if you want to actually do some more complex analysis on group by objects, we again come back to the apply function. So suppose we want to calculate the range um, in, um, like for each of your groups. So in this case, we are grouping by the pclass method, by the pclass variable, and applying the getRange function. So the thing that you should keep in mind over here is that right now, the x uh, variable, it represents an entire data frame. So when you divide your data frame by your pclass, you will have one subset where pclass is 1, another subset where pclass is 2. These individual subsets are essentially data frames. So what gets passed over here as x are these individual data frames. In the previous case, you were actually passing in rows. x over here represents each row. So in this case, you're actually providing the entire data frame. So within x, you can pull in x dot fair and calculate the minimum, calculate the maximum, and then return the difference. So when you run this, you get the range within each of your individual classes. So group by along with the apply method is quite a powerful combination. You can also uh, group by on multiple columns. If you want, so right now you're getting the mean for all the numerical variables in your data frame. If you want for just one of the variables, you can specify which variable it is that you're interested in and then call mean. Another option that you have is the aggregate method. So the advantage here is that you can call different uh, aggregation functions on different columns. So on passenger ID, I call min. On age, I call max. And on fair, I call sum. So this does all of it in one go. Yeah, I think it's just in the formatting, yeah. So. Um, if you switch it around, it'll probably like give it in a different way. Yeah, it'll make one. It'll make one come forward. That's all. But like ultimately. No, no, it'll, that's not the written thing. So it'll make just one class for one, and in one you have many people. In two you have. Many yeah, people. yeah. So it's just the order that comes on before. The individual subset will still be the same, right? Like female one, one female is still the same. Um, but yeah, the values that you will have over here, uh, that should be the same. So um, another common op operation that you'll have is actually merging data sets. So um, it's very rare that when you're working on a data processing problem, you'll have just one data set. So if you have multiple data sets, uh, you, would have, you would at some point have to like merge them together. So um, I'll just briefly go over through the different types of merges. So you have two data frames that we're defining over here, population and countries. So as you can see, the countries in um, the list of countries in both these data frames are not the same. You have some differences. So uh, the first one that we'll go over is left merge. So what you'll see over here is that we are defining the two data frames. We are defining one to be as the left data frame and the other one to be the right data frame, and the variable based on which we are concatenating them. 
and also how we wish to concatenate it. So when we merge it over here, what you can see is all rows which were present in the population data frame, they are retained. Even if it doesn't find a match in the country's data frame, it's still retained, but you'll just have null values over there. So the basic idea is if you say it's a left join, you're giving more emphasis on the left data frame. So everything that's there in the left data frame, it's retained. You won't ever be dropping anything from the left data frame. Similarly, you have the right. So it's the exact same thing. So instead of um, like, I guess Netherlands was the one which was not present in the left data frame. So that's why we have a NAN value over here. So in this case, we ensure that all countries which are present in the right data frame, they are retained in the final output. Uh, so what happens by default when you do not actually provide a value for how is inner join. So inner join essentially makes sure that only if you have matching values in both data frames is that put in your output. So if you have a particular country in population that's not present in countries or vice versa, it's dropped from the final output. So you can provide the inner variable, like the inner argument, and it'll still give you the same output. The outer one is the case in which it does not drop anything. So even if it does not find matches in either of the data frames, it'll still retain everything. So you have United States being retained as well as Netherlands, even though they did not find matches in the corresponding um, data frames. So, uh, the other thing which you'll have to work with a lot is missing data. So we'll create a fake data set over here and we'll see the methods that you can use to kind of you know, clean up your data set. So the most common method is to just fill all your missing values with a value of zero. So you have the fill NA method. So when you call this, all missing values, all null values in your data frame, they get, con they get replaced with zero. If you want to specifically fill one column with a particular value, you can take out that particular column and then give the value that you want to, to be replaced with. So you can see that the variable which was previously called one, it's, uh, wherever it had null values, it now got replaced with the word missing. Uh, there's also the other option of dropping of, um, you know, rows or columns which have null values. So if you take the missing data frame and you call the drop NA method and provide the access zero, it essentially drops all rows which have any missing values in it. So even if it has one missing value in it, it'll drop it off. On the other hand, if you use access equal to one, it'll drop off all columns that have, um, you know, any missing values in it. So yeah, you created a new variable, which is nothing but um, NANS. And so drop NA has an additional parameter, which is not very commonly used per se, but it's just a parameter that they provide. So there's a how parameter. So essentially it says that, um, only if all the variables, all the values in a particular row or column are null, do we drop that. So in this case, even if, even though we did give the access to be one, only this variable six was dropped because it was the only column which had nothing but null values in it. All other columns which had like one or two or three NAND values, they were still retained. So it's just a different behavior that you can expect out of it. Um, yeah, also, if you want to drop based on only a few specific set of uh, variables, uh, you can provide a subset of variables that you're interested in. So you can basically say that only if these columns have a missing value in it, do I consider it to be dropped. So in this case, um, we did a dropping based on just these three variables that we provided in the subset argument. So uh, we have a bunch of exercises over here. So those who feel comfortable with pandas by now, I would say just give it a shot 
and try and see if you can do this. Um, manipulating data, data frames is something that you will find um, to be quite important for your assignments. So I would highly recommend that you get comfortable with using NumPy and Pandas and so on. Um, yeah, and uh, one issue that I've seen a lot of people make is um, a lot of people create copies of their data frames by just typing this. DF2 is equal to DF. Uh, they do the same thing in NumPy as well. This is not creating a new copy. So you would usually assume that I just created a new copy, DF2. If I make some changes to DF2, my DF remains same, um, kind of safe. That's not the case. Uh, this is not an actual memory, you know. The, uh, this is just a, this is creating a pointer. So the variable data frame has a particular memory in space where all your values are stored. When you do this operation, all it's doing is that DF2 is also pointing to the same memory location. So if either of these variables makes a difference, makes a change to that memory space, it will reflect on both the variables. So the proper way to do that is use copy. So when you use copy, a completely new space in your memory is allocated for DF2. So when you make changes to DF2, those changes will not reflect in DF. And that's something which I've seen a lot of people make a mistake on. They just keep changing both of them, not realizing that their original data set is also being changed. And then their numbers don't match, and then they come to office hours and stuff. So uh, there are a lot of uh, like small, minute details like these that you, would, you might miss out on. So I would say start practicing right now itself. Go through these exercises, see if you can figure out how to like solve them. And if not, you can like just reach out to either of us. Yeah. Sorry? Deep copy, I guess that's a specific NumPy uh, function. And that's when you are copying for more than two layers or something like that. Sorry. I guess it depends on how many layers you want to copy. I'm not sure on the exact detail, but uh, for most of uh, your applications, I get copy would work. But I guess deep copy is essentially when you have more than two layers, like uh, 2D array or 3D array, something on that side. Okay. Exactly how I mean, uh, I think you can get onto canvas, but there won't be any grading. I don't think your assignments would be graded by that. or any grading would happen. Yeah, I mean, you can yeah, just sit in the class, look at the lectures, yeah. access the slides and the videos on canvas. And also the solutions are homework. Yeah, 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 yeah. We you can do the homework and then I get check the solutions by looking at the solution afterwards. Yeah, I mean, I think you can come for office hours as well. Yeah, that should be an issue. Do you have any idea? I tried to get So, did you just. Are you there on Piazza right now? I am. I was able to do that. You are on Piazza, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, could you just put in a post over there? And um, we'll, we'll make sure that you have access to campus. I think a lot of the other people, like even people who are enrolled uh, in this course, are facing issues with getting on canvas. Um, yeah, so um, we'll sort it out. Yeah. Just put in a mail over there and say specifically that you're not actually enrolled in the course and you're just auditing. So probably we'll have to use a different channel to get you on canvas. But yeah, we can, yeah. Everyone, yeah, it's kind of hard to like move it around. Uh, I think, um, 
Those so so would be releasing okay, so yeah, something today. Probably one of them. They're, they're I guess material in all of this today was the same. deadline for something. I'm not so sure. So if uh, you can make to one, could you just uh, make a post on Piazza so that like everybody is notified? It is recommended for you to uh, and we'll get back to you. Yeah. Um, if you can, yeah. just make to one of them. Sorry. Um, so uh, this uh, what will it be about? This week is going to be about. I guess we're going to go through the exercises. It's going to be a Python mostly, but if you have questions, yeah. So I think by today itself, you should hear back whether. Um, your enrollment but is this confirmed or not. Is not uh, but uh, just to be safe, just put a Piazza post right now uh, itself not, and no. we can like look over it and like, let you know. Okay, okay. I actually don't know who's uh, teaching it, uh, but... Uh, is there a guarantee that I can get the material before? Because uh, yeah, I, I have no idea about that. Ask him. But that's not, uh, I would go completely out of my control. Is it, is, it's one tomorrow, okay, right? Okay, and the general? I think the recitation people He is not here right now. All night. He is in Washington, so I'm not sure how, like, uh, the communication is going to be. But we here, can but look into it. Like, What's the recitation? I think this week is not going to be really, like, So if you put a post over there, right, uh, I'll make sure to, like, go into the let him know about that. If you have questions. And he can check up on it and let you know. Uh, I mean, yeah, sure. going through pretty much Python. So, like, if you go through it, through the exercises, yeah. um, or ask questions about Python, or anything in the course, course, you can ask. Uh, like, like, but I don't think I'm going to go through the whole course or anything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I would so say, uh, say the structure of the recitations of the yeah, so you can use help is going to be going back and forth. So, I would go through yeah, in, in one of the books, you go through the recitations, you will find like help. Yeah, it's kind of right. Yeah, this. Uh, okay. type I think he's gonna go and back and forth. Name. So I think two people are gonna do one like a documentation. Yeah. After two different people are gonna do and all these packages that we're using are very well documented. Yeah. So you have a good explanation. Yeah. Again, uh, like all good the four recitations yeah. and then figure out which one you like. Yeah. 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 Just make sure. Yeah, yeah. Just make sure don't put brackets after the command. Okay. Yeah, I got it. And also. Uh, I installed this uh, notebook extension, but I, I used um, the, I didn't use pip install, I used this one, um, call line install. Mm -hmm. um, does it make a big difference um, than using I'm pip not install? sure. Uh, it it should. One, right? um, I mean, if I remember correctly, I think I used this one. Yeah, yeah I think I also used this one on the. Um, on the like yeah, comments, so, yeah. yeah. Um, but I use this one, and um, I'm not sure exactly. It worked, but then I don't know when you open. Oh, you have to actually activate it. Where is the first panel? The first. Um. Can you 